好，欢迎大家回来。那么今天呢，我们有非常强大的一个 panel。那么 ，Welcome back. Today we have a very strong panel. You are familiar with these panelists. So on my left hand is a、uh, JP Ramswamy. Uh, he's the uh CDO of a、uh, Deutsche Bank. Uh, he has a very legendary experience. And he learned about uh, uh, economics and statistics, but now he becomes a scientist, the best、uh, data officer in the world. And、uh, on his left is、uh, Mr. Li Fuan, the chairman of、uh, Bohai Bank, and he used、uh, he used to be a、uh, leadership in the innovation department of、uh, CBRC, and he is also very active in the financial front. And、uh, on his Said、uh, left side is、uh, Jane Eric,、uh, J.P. Morgan Managing Director, and also、uh, Vice Chairman of、uh, J.P. Morgan Hong Kong. And she's a very powerful lady in Asia.、Uh, he will,、uh, she will share with us a lot of uh, his uh, her insights. And、uh, to the left is、uh, Ezra Prasa. He is described to best to describe China's economy. And he used to be the China director in IMF, and he's also in Brookings now, and also a professor in Cornell.、Uh, last but not least,、uh, Professor Li Daokui. He's also a world-renowned professor on China, and he's now leading a very important college in Tsinghua University. So welcome our five panelists. Today we're talking about the openness of, and reform of a financial sector in China. In past years, we talk about uh, uh, reform, but open up is another topic.、Uh, Mr. Zhou Xiaochuan in the Lu Jiazui Forum mentioned、uh, openness, and he used a lot of words to describe China's openness.、Uh, if we do not open up, We actually are protecting those lazy people in the financial sector. And after、uh, his speech,、uh, A share in China was、uh, incorporated into MSCI. And now we have a、uh, Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect and Shenzhen Shanghai Stock Connect. And China's new round of openness is becoming a reality. So we want to start from Jin. So A share is now in SMCI. Um, so, how would you expect this will impact China's equity market and also the rest of the world? You are expert on that.、Uh, good afternoon.、Um, I'm very happy to be part of this、uh, panel discussion.、Uh, you mentioned two topics. The first one is、um, Governor Zhou Xiaochuan's comments recently at Lu Jiazui Forum on June 19th.、Uh, the second topic you mentioned is MSCI's inclusion. Of Chinese A shares in its indices,、uh, which was announced on June 20th.、Um, first of all,、uh, we all know Governor Zhou has been a key architect of China's financial reform for the past 15 years.、Uh, during his tenure,、uh, China has freed up interest rates. China has also pursued a path of、uh, globalization of the Chinese currency, the Chinese yuan. Uh, however, we know that、uh, the China's capital markets still is relatively closed to global investors. So it is actually quite heartening to see that MSCI, the major global index, has included China A shares for the very first time in its global indices.、Uh, so I think it's important to recognize that opening up the Chinese financial sector is crucial for China's overall growth. During Governor Zhou's comments in the last two weeks, he mentioned openness basically means increased competition. Increased competition will make Chinese enterprises better and more efficient. In fact, Governor Zhou has cited the success of the Chinese manufacturing industry in the past many years. Because of the opening to the outside world, the Chinese manufacturing sector has become quite globally competitive. Now it's the financial sector's turn to open itself up. To global competition, as we know, if you look at the Chinese banking system, of course, it is still dominated by the large state banks in China.、Uh, foreign banks combined have only two percent market share in China, so that's still relatively limited. Now, when we look at financial markets, 
Uh, we know China has the second largest economy in the world. The equity market, I think, is among the top five as well in terms of overall market capitalization. China's bond market now is number three in the world after the US and Japan. But foreign participation in the Chinese capital market remains quite limited. So the recent announcement by MSCI to include Chinese A shares in its global indices has a very important symbolic move. So it's only symbolic? Well, it is symbolic because um, China has been trying for four years now to have MSCI include A shares in its indices. Finally, the step has been taken. But the initial weighting is very small. A shares only account for 0.73% of MSCI emerging markets. Um, I don't want to be too technical here because Chinese shares are listed in many exchanges around the world, in New York, in Hong Kong, in London, as well as in mainland China. So many of these overseas listed Chinese shares have already been included in MSCI indices for many years. But for the very first time, on June 20th of this year, MSCI has decided to include Chinese A shares, meaning those listed in Shanghai and Shenzhen, in its global but, but, indices. But they can be expanded for the, uh, for the equities that be included into the MSCI. So what would be the biggest the setback for, for the broadening of the uh, more equities being included in? Is it, it quota? Mm -hmm. Is it quota of the uh, Shengang Chung and Hugang Chung? Do you think quota will be abolished in the, down, in, uh, in, so in the near term? It's important uh, to think about how foreign institutions can access the Chinese capital market. They can use the Qualified Institutional Investor Scheme, called QFII. They can also use the relatively new Connect program yeah. between Shanghai and Hong Kong and Shanghai and Shenzhen. So um, I think it boils down to uh, the fact that now MSCI is including A shares in the global indices. And I think this will attract more international capital into the Chinese A share market. So just to conclude, you know, I think this is very much in keeping with Governor Zhou Xiaotuan's comments about opening China's financial markets to the outside world, including banking, insurance, capital markets. I think increased competition and increased participation by foreign institutions in the Chinese financial sector will bring about more competition, and competition will make Chinese institutions become much more efficient and much more competitive. Thank you, Jing, but would you please answer my question? Do you think the quota of the QFI and also quota for the Shengang Tung and Hugang Chung will be um, expanded, will be abolished, this kind of quota? Uh, right still? now, uh, there are still quotas in place uh, for foreign institutions participating in the Chinese Asia market. I think it is only a matter of time. It may happen in the next three years when all quotas are removed, but I think the Chinese um, regulators will pursue the opening at a gradual pace, not immediately, but I think I'm quite confident in the medium term, meaning three to five years from now, I think all quotas should be abolished. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Jane mentioned that uh, uh, foreign-funded banks have already in China for many years. Uh, before, they were considered as a threat, and after many years, they still consider only 2% of the market share. So Mr. Li Fuan, uh, as a former regulator and now a participant in the banking system in China, how do you see the openness of China's financial system? system no this economy is beneficiary of the openness, and the current financial banking system establishment is like 100 years ago when the banking system is, was introduced into China. When I was a CBRC uh, regulator um, in the past 20 years, we saw the benefits brought about by uh, foreign investment banks in China's competition. However, uh, after the Asia and the global financial crisis, uh, the foreign banks slow down in their growth in China. So once they account for 4%, but uh, now only 2%. This is not because of our restraint. This is because they're naturally slowing down after the financial crisis. So they lost some opportunities in their development in China. Premier Li Keqiang said this morning, we will uh, further uh, loosen up the regulations against the foreign banks. I think that's a positive signal attracting more foreign funded banks in China. We will push forward the reform and uh, 
uh, WTO negotiation. Now we see the accession into WTO bring a lot of benefits to China. Bohai Bank uh, was very open. We introduced the uh, 20% uh, of uh, Standard Charter Bank's share, and next will go public and, in, uh, and incre uh, attract more foreign investors. I hope that uh, banks like uh, Bohai Bank can benefit from the openness. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. So uh, this is about 20% of a restraint. It needs to be removed, but how long will it take? Uh, Jing uh, predict a medium term for the QFA quota to be removed. Uh, at the very beginning, the policy came into being because China was first uh, was initially listed into uh, WTO, and there might be impact from the outside, but people were not sure about how big the impact is. So. They set up the constraint of 20%. After accession into WTO, after 10 years of development, we thought uh, the impact, the real impact, was much smaller than expected. And China is able to control it. So in the new round of opening up, how can we really learn the expertise and strength from the international competitors. The only way is to open up. Although China's banks are very big, and China, that's because China has a large economy and large population, but in terms of quality, the number one bank in China still lagged behind in terms of uh, innovation, service, and uh, professionalism uh, compared with world number one bank. So by opening up and the introduce competition, uh, it will be a very effective way for us to learn. Thank you. So Mr. Li Daokui, if China accelerates its uh, financial reform, is it a good thing? Because uh, RMB is still faced with depreciation pressure, and also uh, there are some uh, regulative measures against the outflow of the capital. I think this is a good opportunity for China to open up. I can uh, put my answer here, and then I will elaborate on that. So I want to uh, tell you a basic principle that uh, financial sector is different from manufacturing sector. Manufacturing sector produce products. So uh, the only need to open up its product. But for a financial sector, there are two meanings. Uh, the first. The security firms, banks, and uh, uh, other enterprises, are they allowed to open up for foreign investment? So in the service market, are you opening up or not? In this term, the Chinese banks are very open. For example, 10 years ago, CBRC had a, a rule that anyone opens up banks in China, you need to introduce foreign strategic investors. Uh, there's a very clear definition of the proportion. So this is a very interesting uh, example. Uh, you need to introduce foreign strategic investors so that you can establish a bank in China. But on the other hand, the capital flow, whether capital flow is open, so the open of capital flow need to be prudent because uh, foreigners might not know the Chinese market very well. Uh, they might uh, speculate on the prospect of China's economy. But what about the uh, uh, stock connect between Shanghai and Shenzhen, and, uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Hong Kong? So the next focus might be the openingness of uh, the capital flow because I think the service market is already opened up enough. So the investment banks uh, was required to have uh, at least 50% of the shares hold by Chinese. But now uh, investment banks might have 100% of uh, foreign capital. Because uh, the Chinese people now know the game. Uh, they are not afraid. 
to my observation, as long as it's a service sector, be it strategic consultancy or retail or uh, express delivery, the Chinese domestic enterprise will have strength. Seldom does foreign companies uh, succeed in these areas in China, so as long as it's service sector. However, uh, the key now lies in the capital market and capital flow openness. China's economy is now at a turning point. We predict that in 2016 to 17, the growth will be uh, equalized, and in 2018, it will uh, grow a little bit. And the major factor is the uh, private investment recovered. After the 19th CPC Central uh, Congress, uh, the private investment might grow at an even faster speed. Also, you mentioned uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, in recent years, they have also uh, learned their trades. They pay a lot of attention to Chinese market. If they add interest rate too fast, they will look at the Chinese market, and they will uh, consider to be more prudent. So. Uh, Donald Trump is a kind of noisy administration. He likes to um, make a lot of uh, waves. It will have the financial market fluctuate. So once uh, Trump has some problem, it will affect the financial market in the U.S. So my judgment is that RMB depreciation pressure from now to future will not fluctuate very much. So now it's a very good opportunity to promote the openness of uh, the capital flow. As we're His assessment is forecasting for the RMB and also for the Fed and also for the Mr. Trump. Let me begin with a set of remarks on an issue we've already touched upon, which is uh, what China has done in terms of capital account opening and financial market reforms, and it connects to the RMB, of course. At one level, what China is doing is crazy, because what the academic literature, what the experiences of other countries show is very, very clear. What you should do is get the financial system fixed first, and then make your exchange rate more market determined and flexible, and then open up the capital account. So China has gone about it in exactly the opposite direction. But there is a logic to it. One thing we have learned also from the experiences of other countries, and I think China stands out in this respect, is that reforms, especially to the financial system, are extraordinarily hard. Because, again, the system as it is presently structured works wonderfully well for those who are already in charge of the banks, of the state-owned enterprises, the provincial governments. So what China has been doing very effectively, in my view, is using external stimuluses as a way of removing opposition to domestic reforms. We saw that in the case of the WTO, as was mentioned by Li Fuan. Um, but I think the notion of getting the renminbi into the IMS SDR basket, the notion of getting the A shares into the MSCI, provided a very clear checklist of things that China needed to do. And by God, China did all those things. Now, in the absence of that checklist, would it have been possible to move forward? I think certainly reformers like Governor Joe probably wanted to do those things, but it was very difficult to do. Even in China, as I've come to learn, now that I understand China a little better, uh, Beijing's diktat doesn't always get uh, uh, followed. So having this uh, framework becomes very, very important. And the other aspect is using capital account opening as a catalyst for domestic reforms. And um, uh, Jing Ulrich uh, referred to this. At some level, using um, capital account opening as a way of creating more competition, as a way of creating more depth, breadth, and liquidity in financial markets, especially when it comes to opening up uh, corporate and government bond markets, all of those are crucial. The difficulty with using this upside down strategy is that it imposes a bigger burden. You need to have a better communication strategy you need to have a more clearly articulated macroeconomic framework because you're going to be subject to the whims of market expectations. And you're going to have a better regulatory structure so that the financial system can operate more uh, smoothly. 
We've seen a lot of volatility in financial markets, in the exchange markets over the last couple of years, and I think this points to a big problem that China faces. It's not that there have been no reforms over the last two years, but virtually every reform one can point to is about the capital markets, it's about the financial markets, it's about capital market opening. If you look at the real side of the economy, if you look at the institutional side of the economy, what you need for markets to work well, like better corporate governance structures, better um, legal structures, more corporate and public transparency, you don't have that. So you have this big imbalance, and that, I think, exposes the economy to particular risk, especially when it comes to the exchange rate, because that is ultimately the most important relative price that is intermediated uh, between domestic and international investors. So I think what we are going to see, even if China continues to move in the right direction in terms of opening up its capital markets, in terms of developing its financial system, if these other reforms don't take place at the same time, what you could end up having is markets very often misinterpreting what is happening in China and creating a lot of volatility in the exchange markets. The right answer to that is not to clamp down on the exchange markets and say, let's force stability in the exchange rate, which I think is often what ends up being done, but to say, let's get the underlying framework right so that uh, the market can better determine the exchange rate in a manner that is consistent with economic fundamentals. So I see a fair bit of volatility very, ahead. Very quickly, Esva. So along this line uh, to the fundamental of the uh, economy for the exchange rate, do you think that the uh, uh, counter-cyclical factor for determining the uh, renminbi's parity, do you think a good move or a bad move? If only we fully understood what the counter-cyclical factor was, I could answer the question. And this, I think, again, is a potential problem because the way the counter-cyclical factor was introduced, uh, many market participants immediately interpreted it as an excuse for the PBOC to be able to manage the RMB's value in a stable manner against the dollar. So the logic behind the counter-cyclical um, factor may well have been that the dollar is now depreciating and it may not make a lot of sense for the RMB to depreciate along with it. Um, so it may be simply a way of saying, let's go back to trying to manage the currency's value against a basket. But unless this is communicated, and especially uh, in an environment where there isn't that much credibility that the PBOC has in terms of what it is trying to do, I think the communication becomes even more important. But having said all that, I think what is most likely over the rest of the year is stability of the uh, RMB by and large relative to the dollar, especially with the party congress coming up in November. I don't see much room for volatility in any of these dimensions. But so, I think so you agree with uh, Professor Lee? To some extent, yeah. yes. Thank you very much. I think that we have to move very quickly uh, to the another topic because we, we don't have enough time. Um, so we have been talking about uh, the opening up of the financial uh, market uh, as well as uh, the regulatory framework. At uh, present, the debt market in China has been the international focus. Uh, so the uh, development of the Chinese uh, uh, economy and the profits uh, of uh, companies and the strength of the financial market uh, are all the important factors for us to take into consideration in the coming years. In order to reduce the debt, the Chinese government is uh, uh, curbing the leverage ratio this is a very important for China. So financial deliverage at present is a very important tool for the Chinese government. And uh, there are a lot of uh, policies at uh, present. Uh, Mr. Uh, Li Fu'an, so you have you worked as a regulator before and you know a lot about the macro economy. So what do you think of the measures of the Chinese government to uh, government for Deleverage for the uh, the uh, uh, the shrinking of the M2 uh, by the Central Bank of China, and so what do you think of these measures? So first of all, about the rating of uh, the Standard Poor. So in the past, we were very 
passive in rating, but in recent years, uh, we are becoming more cooperative with the rating uh, agencies. So in the past, uh, China was uh, rated low because of the asymmetrical information. Uh, and uh, later, we actively provided information for the rating agencies. Uh, the, at uh, present, the rating agencies and invest investment uh, 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 the companies, uh, well, are in China, but it seems that they do not understand that much of China or the Chinese economy. As a matter of fact, the Chinese economy is not uh, infatuating that much. So the total leverage as compared with the developing countries is not that high. The only difference is that the leverage has been growing at a higher speed. So one point I would like to clarify. So although the leverage has been growing in China, but the growing rate has been decreasing all the time. So this is one point I would like to clarify. You are right. So if we have uh, too high a leverage or the leverage growth rate is uh, too high, it will improve, uh, impose too much pressure. Uh, so on the monetary policy, the United States is uh, taking new measures. Uh, and uh, I don't think that the leverage goes uh, uh, against the uh, market liberalization. And uh, at present, we are also trying our best to get rid of uh, the overcapacity. And uh, this is uh, very much uh, similar to the deleverage process in the financial market. The Chinese, uh, the Chinese government has its debt. But as compared with the Western governments, where the debt is uh, mainly used for public goods, the local governments in China have been financing in the debt market in order that they can get financial resources for the uh, infrastru infrastructure development in China. And they do this mainly in the PPP uh, model. As a matter of fact, uh, so through the debt financing, the local Chinese governments uh, are improving their capacity in paying off the debts. So I would say that the, Chinese, uh, the local Chinese government are not under too much pressure, as pointed out by, uh, Ms., uh, by Premier Li Keqiang in the morning, that uh, when the market plays an even important role, the market will, fulf will fulfill its uh, uh, purpose. So, Mr. Uh, Li, can you say a few words uh, about uh, CBRC and their radical regulatory work at the present? Well, I'm not working with uh, uh, CBRC anymore, but anyway, I think it is important for us to strengthen our regulation in order that uh, the commercial banks can be more confident uh, in the market, and that will greatly promote uh, competition in the market. Uh, so, the issue of over leverage and the root cause of um, high leverage is basically overcapacity in some of the um, state owned enterprises. So China's debt ratio has risen quite substantially in the last 10 years. So the current debt to uh, GDP is around 260%. Uh, it could be even higher if you add con contingent liabilities such as unfunded pension. So this number is very high. But China's debt problem uh, is different from the debt problem elsewhere in the world. Uh, number one, Chinese households are savers. Uh, the Chinese public sector, meaning uh, the central government, has very low levels of debt. So this is very different from the US, where federal debt is over 100% of GDP. Uh, but central government debt in China is only 
under 20 percent of Sorry, GDP. Sorry, because I, I think that we don't have enough time to elaborate on the uh, very uh, detailed that situation in China. Can I ask you a very quick question? Do you think the downgrading of the uh, uh, Moody's is justified? Yes or no? You know, I can't comment on the rating agency's decision, but I think it's important to look forward to a path to resolve China's uh, over leverage problem. Uh, so what I said before is actually critically important. If you don't understand the nature of the debt problem, how can you even begin to solve the problem? So hear me out here. So we need to think about the corporate sector debt. Right now, it's around 150% of GDP. So the Chinese government has already undertaken a series of steps to merge uh, some of the enterprises to make them more efficient. Uh, they've also begun to focus on credit growth and GDP growth. If China GDP growth is around 6.5%, credit growth should be along the same lines, 6% or 7%. However, currently, credit growth is in the double digits, 12% to 13%. So this cannot continue forever. If debt growth is twice the level of GDP growth, that means China's debt ratio will continue to increase. So to solve this problem, we need to fundamentally reform the Chinese corporate sector, especially the state-owned enterprise sector in the traditional industries. Also, local governments, which actually have relatively high levels of debt. But in the recent quarter, local government debt situation has improved because number one, the housing market has improved. And as we all know, the local governments a lot of the times rely on land sales for their resources, for their, for their revenue. So with a recovery in the property sector, local government finances have been improving in the recent couple of quarters. So eventually, we need to reduce China's debt to GDP ratio. 260% is way too high. So that means we need to reduce capacity in some of the uh, industries, especially in traditional sectors. We also need to um, lower the debt ratio for local governments, meaning local governments have to find different ways to finance themselves rather than just borrowing through their vehicles called LGFVs. So maybe local governments should be raising more corporate bonds, uh, more municipal bonds to finance themselves. And finally, there needs to be more uh, division of labor between the center and the local governments, because fiscal reform for yeah. me is quite important, right? The central government takes in a lot of revenue, but the local government are responsible for yeah. a lot of the expenditure. So fiscal reform is also part of the deleveraging process. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Dao Kui Jiao Shou, you can you comment on the recent decisions in the recent decisions? First of all, I so would you also like to say a few words uh, so about the leverage? Well, I think we should give uh, more opportunities to our friend from India. Well, our Indian friend is a scientist. Well, in spite of that, I think we should listen to uh, the Indian friend. So I will cut my presentation short, and then uh, we are going to listen to our Indian friend. Well. The financial regulation is uh, very important. So the growth rate uh, of uh, M1 uh, is uh, lower than the growth rate of a GDP. I think this is a very good sign, and this should be attributed uh, to uh, CBRC. Now, CBRC has uh, adopted a new rule, so which has made all this happen. So CBRC has contributed a lot to the good turn of the financial markets in the uh, recent months. Well, regulation is uh, very important. Uh, however, at the same time, we have to recognize that uh, so threat is a necessary evil. Is a, so threat is a necessary evil. So. This should, the companies should be reminded what the market is like at present. Secondly, uh, so about the Moody rating, well, so I don't think we should not, we should take it too seriously. Uh, so Moody rating was probably done by a few uh, young graduates from uh, the uh, uh, MBA program. So how much do they know about China? China economy has such a big volume. So how can uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, young uh, the young graduates evaluate such a big economy. So, uh, so when we talk about uh, basketball, I think we should uh, um, well so listen to Jordan rather than so the uh, uh, young uh, fresh players. Technology, these kind of new things that the technology are transforming the uh, whole financial industries. So as a scientist, how do you look at the role of the science and technology to change your company and also to change the industry? I think uh, Professor Lee was mentioning earlier that you know, banking doesn't manufacture things, it's a service sector. So when you think that banks are fundamentally relationships and capabilities strung together with data, then the, the reason why a number of people, including my CEO, say banks are technology companies is because what banks are today is becoming more and more technology driven. When you look at what's happening in China, I'm like a child in a sandpit because what a scientist would want to see is some disruptive innovation, a different way of doing things applied at scale, okay? China has scale that is very hard to create anywhere else. It has people using smartphones twice the size of America's population. It has people unbanked the size of America's population. And it has a willingness to have leapfrog technology to say we've left the traditional structures and gone straight on to the smartphone. Okay? The result of that is a Petri dish at a scale where it is no surprise that seven out of 17 fintech unicorns are Chinese in origin. Mm. And when we see the innovations, and you really understand what those leapfrogging techniques are doing, you know, to say that pause machines are not required any longer within Chinese retail because the QR code, coupled with integrated applications of the, you know, the BAT scale, means that people are doing things in banking that from outside, you know, the global implication for me is these are things I learn from, okay? So now when I'm looking at technology within my own bank, while there are many things I could learn about the wholesale side to say, you know, make sure data is owned by the business, completely build a new data infrastructure, bring the necessary standardization and simplification, use internet technologies to be able to drive this, change in how you develop and deploy applications, build digital workplaces. What you don't get at quite the same level is the impact on the end customer. And from China, I can watch customer lives changing at speed and scale. So that's why I'm like a child in a sandbox when I come here. I have to look at what people are actually doing rather than just read about it. Yeah. And so the, thank the, you for, for the innovation is amazing. <laughs> So by, uh, let me ask you a uh, very quickly two questions. Do you think that technology has changed the business model of the finance, or uh, technology has changed the, uh, our uh, way to uh, assess the risk, the model? Has the model has been changed? I think it goes back to data. Okay? We have a capacity to collect data that we could not before. You don't sample as much, you can actually get accurate data. The standardization and the collection capacity means that you know, uh, everything and everyone has become a sensor and actuator, mm -hmm. so that you're not making simulation models based on loose assumptions as more. You can keep refining and tightening the assumptions. You can iterate. Therefore, our ability to understand what is happening, to be able to respond to it, to build the right regulations, all these have improved because of technology advances. So it's not that... So it's an improvement <clears throat> instead of a, uh, uh, the, the model change. Uh, well, some of, the, some of the models would change themselves because the, one of the impacts of technology is it reduces barriers to entry. So yes. now you're not just talking but about... Some, in some other areas, the entry even behind higher, so the uh, impact of entry is different according to the new report of IMF. Well, it's what, complicated. You know, in order to get 68, 69% of people being willing to yeah, use smartphones, uh, over 40% to use payments via mobile, over 35% using insurance via mobile, these changes could not have happened if the barriers to entry were high. Yes, you know, you've got the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent sort of uh, platforms at scale, but these platforms are doing things 
that none of their equivalents in the rest of the world are doing, which means it becomes a learning experience and it is actually changing the customer experience. Yeah, thank you, JP. Uh, Dong and can you talk about how technology changed Bohai Bank? Of course, internet, smart application, and big data changed our lives. Of course, it will also change our financial services. Bohai Bank has only been there for 10 years, and we established only one office in 24 provinces, respectively. If we want to match ICBC and other uh, banks in terms of outlets, uh, we will fail. But we can make full use of the internet banking. And we work with the internet companies to innovate so that we can have a lightweight asset, lightweight uh, employee base. So the counter services in 2016 uh, was transformed onto the internet platform Now, only 70% of the business is still done in counter, while 70% is done online. So uh, the only thing you need to go to a counter for service is to open or close an account. Other services can all be enjoyed online. But of course, the risk uh, assessment and uh, check and approval procedures m may be changed. And the regulatory measures need also change accordingly. It will push forward the internet banking development instead of uh, setting up barriers. Um, before, the credit investigation is mainly searching information. But now, these information are all on the internet. You don't need to refer to those paper tables or charts anymore. So you can use the new technologies to create new risk assessment models and change the internal procedures of the banking service and the business. So those will be real changes to the banks. Thank you very much. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Bohai Bank is a direct sales bank and has uh, good opportunities with the channels. Well. There are two types of accounts, type one and type two. Do you think such division will um, have any impact in the future? I think we should still have a rule in the banks. Uh, after the financial reform, uh, the financial services need to be deepened so that the per capita number of accounts or um, per person can be increased. But now people have too many accounts in the bank. Sometimes one even forgot how many accounts he has with a bank. Uh, now they should have a uh, more professional or dedicated accounts, for example, for his uh, uh, housing mortgage and the other for his uh, car insurance, etc. So I think more open uh, regulations should be adopted. Clay, please. Yes, so um, JP Morgan is the largest financial institution globally by market capitalization. Uh, where market cap is around 320 billion US dollars. The reason why we're very successful as a company is because we never stop in investing in technology. So just to give you some numbers, in 2016, we invested 9.5 billion US dollars in technology, of which 3 billion basically was spent on new initiatives, and 600 million US dollars was spent on fintech uh, solutions. Uh, we have only one goal in mind, which is to serve the customers better, right? So with digital, big data, machine learning, all those 
areas we're investing in will benefit consumers because they can do things much more online. Uh, we were providing end-to-end -end digital banking in the United States. Also, in terms of investment products, as you know, in the U.S., many investors are investing by themselves. So now they can get investment advice, not from a, a real person, an investment advisor, but actually from a machine and digitally. So I think um, for a bank like ours, and also for all the financial institutions in the world, innovation is absolute, absolutely the key for future growth and future success. Yeah, and also the, actually the JP Morgan is regarded as a pioneer of the technology change in the financial sector. And the, your uh, global CEO, Jamie Dimon, called JP Morgan actually a technology company. So congratulations on that. Uh, 我想我们还有一点点时间, uh, we still have uh, some time left. Um, you can ask questions now. Please identify yourself before raising your question. Cohen, thank you very much. I have a very quick question. Uh, if you look at the storage and uh, this accumulation of data, IDC, a marketing research firm, estimated by 2025, we will need to store 180 zettabyte of data, which is 180 plus 21 zeros. So Amazon, and if you use it through just a normal broadband, it will take you 45, 450 million years to transfer and store those data. So I think there is a need to invest in data refinery. Uh, I understand Amazon, they use container to store this data in cloud computing. And at the moment, they're only storing 15 petabytes, which is 15 zeros. So what I'm like, uh, interested in the panel view on data refinery. Thank you very much. JP, please, your expert. Well, I, th I think Amazon probably store more than 15 petabytes. I mean, at, at Deutsche Bank, we have a lot more than that. Uh, I think I, I put three things. One, the cost of storage has changed alarmingly over the last 30 years. You know, most of you would not even recognize how much you can hold in your, you know, on your smartphone. The problem is we've forgotten how to delete. Okay, uh, we, we, we win some skills, we lose some, but uh, you know, human ingenuity is such that we continue to find better and better ways to store. By 2025, we would expect to see that whether we're using you know, DNA type approaches, whether we've improved compression, or for that matter, whether we've gone to a point where, you know, what you're calling the refinery, uh, I've always maintained that there's something a professor called Clay Shirky first said to me, right? there is no such thing as information overload, there is only filter failure. Okay? We will keep designing better filters to throw away the things we don't want, because included in all the stuff we're storing today is a vast amount of rubbish. Okay? And one of the ways of solving some of our storage problems is to be much more focused on where the signal is. When Li Fong was talking about the, the big data and the analytics work, a lot of that work, you know, we have a lab of 80 people who are just dedicated data scientists, and a part of that work is how to get that signal out of the noise. And that comes not just from compression techniques, but before that, getting rid of what you don't need. Okay, and, and we all, I think, have to get better at dealing with our data rubbish. How many of you have ever looked at the photographs you've stored? Okay, just yeah. ever. You know, you don't know how many there are, you don't know how to find them, and you spend forever trying to deal with that. That's when artificial intelligence, machine learning, is beginning to change it, but we've got to take it one step further. We've got to get responsible. Those resources have a cost to them, even if they're low. And I think collectively we will change that. Yeah, thank you very much. As to the uh, technology and the AI and a lot of new things, I think that another a very new thing in the financial world is a virtual currency. So, Esva, uh, we know you are the expert of uh, currency. You wrote a book on China, RMB, and also you wrote a book on the dollar. Uh, I heard uh, that you are going to write another book on virtual currency. So, um, what is your view on the nature of the virtual currency? Are they currencies? Should they be regulated? Please. Uh, I could spend a bit of time on that. Um, what I think we are seeing is a very interesting uh, phenomenon, which is a bifurcation of the traditional roles of a currency 
usually used to have the multiple roles, that of a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and a store of value, all bundled into one currency um, or uh, one um, uh, <coughs> physical entity. So now those entities are no longer going to be physical. They're going to be largely electronic. And I think we are seeing this bifurcation. So if you think about uh, things like Bitcoin, certainly right now they do seem to have some value. But I think the ultimate um, change, the effect is going to be that they are going to be very effective as units of account, as mediums of exchange. But government-backed or government-issued fiat currencies are still going to be important stores of value. So how things play out in this world where these uh, are uh, differentiated so substantially, I think, remains to be seen. It creates a lot of interesting questions in terms of macro. I don't think we have good answers to them. How one thinks about just the creation of money, how one thinks about um, uh, provision of liquidity to the financial system, how one thinks about uh, um, ensuring value in, the, um, uh, in this asset, which is um, a very particular type of money. I think these are all open questions at this stage, and I certainly don't have answers yet. Yeah, thank you very much. Dao Kui Jiao Shou, you want to point out? So, Professor Li Dao Kui, well, as a matter of fact, so digital money now has uh, two important, uh, two layers uh, of uh, meanings. And first, firstly, it is uh, the money, and uh, secondly, now the money is uh, created uh, by the computer system, but. Whatever happens, the government will be the main player, will be the main creator of uh, digital money. So I don't think that Ma Yun will be in the position of creating uh, the uh, digital money. Well, now, so the virtual money such as uh, Bitcoin are just like uh, a kind of a financial asset. So do you think that the government can regulate it? Well. I think it is more about speculation. Therefore, I don't think it will serve as the real uh, money. So then. Sorry. I, what, what, I didn't hear. Yeah, virtual currency. Uh, is it currency or is it a financial asset? I, I think that the, 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 the point Ishwa was making that we are being able to see a divergence between the unit of account, the medium of exchange, and the store of value becomes possible because something is digital. So I still think of it as currency. But beyond that, what becomes fascinating is the possibility that because of the low cost of maintaining the currency, administering the currency, we are now able to do things like go into decimal places and points where one-tenth, one-hundredth, one-thousandth, one-millionth become as easy to do, where in an analog currency, you had to know how many decimal points you have, and you had to have physical tokens to deal with it. That means we can price things at a micro level that we couldn't before. And that has value, because you can now measure things in an economy, uh, which were hard to measure, because the cost of measuring exceeded the apparent value of measuring. And now, when you really have a continuum for currency to be associated as value to do with the transaction. It may change some of the ways we look at how we measure things. And when it comes to the value side, I, I know I've never been able to change my mind that unless people think it is valuable, it has no value. And so uh, how, if you have a currency, it becomes valuable as soon as it has a population that it has currency, that it is in use, it is in circulation. And once you have that, it creates value by itself. It's not, you know, what backs it. That may be one of the reasons why someone uses it. Yeah, thank you. But I'm sure that uh, someone will stand out and say that this is uh, not allowed because uh, uh, this someone will come out uh, uh, to regulate the circulation of such a uh, such uh, the virtual money such as a bitcoin so, so probably in the future the PBRC will create uh, the digital money but n others may not be allowed to do that uh, I'm from uh, Le Shi financial news uh, so in recent years uh, fintech 
has brought about a lot of uh, new opportunities. Uh, for example, the technology of uh, blockchain. So would you like to say a few words about the impact of a blockchain on the uh, development of the Chinese uh, market? And uh, will that bring China uh, to the uh, leadership uh, position of uh, the chi of uh, of China. So, would you apply uh, in in the uh, in the financial sector? I think there's a broader question here about what technology does, and uh, Li Fuan uh, referred to this at one level that it makes it easier to bring more people into the formal financial system. It makes it at one level easier uh, to create uh, regulatory frameworks because it's easier to gather information and so on. But it comes up against a fundamental problem if you think about how to make the financial system better and more stable, which is have you changed the incentives in the financial system? And going back to a comment that David made earlier about uh, you know, the China-India um, comparisons and so on, I think we are unfortunately in the same boat that although there are um, many improvements in terms of financial inclusion, um, many more people being brought into the financial system through mobile banking, certain transactions becoming cheaper and easier to uh, execute, but the fundamental incentives have not changed. So unless we can get the incentives to work better, especially in the banking system, we don't get very much progress in terms of what we want the financial system to do, which is to allocate capital effectively from savers to investors. Um, so I think technology is going to help but ultimately, we are going to have to get the incentives right and let the markets work a lot better with the government enabling rather than interfering with the functioning of financial institutions. Yeah, thank you very much. Yu Qing. Uh, so I'm from, uh, I'm from a manufacturer company. I would like to put a question to Mr. Li Daokui. Internationalization of uh, RMB is a very important issue, which we have not touched upon yet. So at uh, present, China, uh, so RMB is under great uh, pre pressure of a depreciation. So I would like to ask whether the trend is going to continue. Uh, thank you. This is a, a very uh, good. This is a very good question. As a matter of fact, uh, the transaction in RMB decreased by about thirty percent. So I would give the floor to Professor Li Daokui to explain it. Well, as China so far is the biggest producer of uh, goods. Uh, taking up about 25 to 50 percent. So, for example, the uh, steel and uh, refrigerators and uh, all kinds of uh, goods. So, China so far is uh, a net saver of uh, money, and China is uh, still developing at a very high speed. So, a lot of companies uh, hope that they can invest in China, and uh, MCI is a typical example. And a lot of Chinese companies uh, are eager to invest overseas because we have a lot of uh, deposits, uh, and uh, the uh, There might be some fluctuation in the financial uh, market uh, because of uh, the different exchange uh, rates. And with the time passing, probably now, so a lot of assets might be disseminated in uh, Chinese, uh, so in the Chinese yuan. It might take time, but that will be the trend. Very briefly, please. So almost certainly the RMB is going to start playing a bigger role as a payments currency. The Chinese economy is um, the second largest in the world. It is a huge trading economy. Um, so once things settle down, I think as a payments currency, it will start playing a more important role. <coughs> it has become a de jure de uh, reserve currency already, and already a de facto one, because many central banks around the world are holding it. But I think it's unlikely to become a safe haven currency, because what that requires is a lot of institutions uh, and the rule of law rather than just a good financial system. So if China is able to move forward with economic and financial market reforms, 
I think that NMB will play a significantly important role as a payments currency, could eventually become a reserve currency, but is highly unlikely to become a safe haven currency um, even in the long run. Yeah, thank you very much. I think our time is almost up. Now we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to ask you to wrap up. So almost the end of uh, the discussion. So I would like to ask you one more question. So uh, in 2018, the new political cycle, a new political page will start in China. So what do you think might happen So in uh, uh, 20? At 18. So, what kind of a black swans we might see? So, shall we start with Professor Li Daokui? Well, in 2018, there might be large scale reform in the state owned enterprises and also the reform of the fiscal policies in China because a new uh, generation of a government so will start its office. At the same time, so there are a lot of uh, uh, changes in the neighboring countries, and these I think we should take into uh, consideration. So I agree with David that SOE reforms and uh, broader financial market reforms are the thing, but I would express them as hopes rather than realities for next year. I'm very hopeful that we will start seeing significant progress on these real side reforms and also the institutional reforms, but I'm far from certain that we will actually see very significant uh, uh, movement. Um, by definition, it's difficult to predict black swan events, but I think what we are going to see is a fair bit of volatility in financial markets, um, but not necessarily for the wrong reasons, for the right reasons. As China does move forward with capital market opening, with financial sector reforms, uh, I think we are going to see some stumbles, again, for the reason I mentioned that it's a very unbalanced development with financial market reforms, but without the real side and institutional reforms. So the best case scenario is we get reforms in all sides. Yeah, thank you, Jing. Final word. Well, looking out to 2018, uh, I'm quite hopeful that the consumer sector and the service industry in China will continue to drive growth. Because right now, the service industry actually accounts for a larger share of GDP compared to the manufacturing industry. So I would think uh, the reforms should come from the central government to further support uh, the service sector and the consumer sector, as well as innovation at the grassroots. Innovation, entrepreneurship, which will continue to drive the economy forward. In terms of risks, um, I would say the highest risks are geopolitical risks, both in the region and globally. Think about North Korea, think about the Middle East. And uh, geopolitical tension actually has been rising globally. But interestingly enough, we're seeing very low levels of volatility in the financial markets in the world. US markets are at or near all-time highs, even though geopolitical risk in the world um, have been rising. So I would say at some future point, either financial market risks and volatility increases or geopolitical risks subside, because there's been a dis disconnect because globally, we're seeing risk rising on the geopolitical front, but financial markets are going from strength to strength. At some point, something has to give, right? So that's my uh, prediction for 2018, rising political risk and probably rising financial market volatility. Thank you very much. Fuan Dong Xizhang. I think that uh, so I believe uh, that uh, in the year 2018, so we are going to uh, see a steady uh, economic growth when we change gears. Secondly, the Chinese economy is uh, huge. It is uh, very important uh, for us uh, to have a steady uh, development of our economy if we develop too fast or uh, too slow, so there might be risks, and therefore it is very important for us to balance the development at the right growth rate. At present, the Chinese economy is taking up a great proportion in the international 
uh, economy, and therefore, so it is a very also very important for us to balance the domestic development and also the international economy. So in this way, we can reduce the fluctuation in the uh, international market. In 2018, is for the first time the learnings and experience of Chinese fintech platforms being exported at scale beyond China uh, from unbanked areas through underbanked to fully banked areas and how that collision will take place as those completely new ways of working get exported and how they come back because they will get mutated when they meet is going to yield some of the most exciting times within uh, the experiences both of you were referring to of the customer because the person who gains from all that innovation at scale will be the customer. And I think we're, we're on the verge of something quite exciting there. But uh, what would be the Black Swan event in technology in 2018? Uh, how we make that possible, uh, there are enough headwinds in terms of where you can hold and sort of make data resident, what you can share. There, there are enough headwinds within that environment for us to have to get right. So the risk that it doesn't happen at the pace one might see is in learning how we are going to have to manage and control that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for all your uh, presentations. Uh, thank you very much for attending the 